I'm happy to introduce Professor Johann Edelheim. He is part of the International Media, Communication, and Tourism Studies Department here at Hokkaido University. He's currently teaching courses on tourist attractions, film and tourism, and tourism, media, and thought. What is the definition of tourism? You're using the uh, word the definition, mm. and of course this is uh, depending on who you ask. So essentially if we uh, go for a really technical definition then it would be the United Nations World Tourism Organization which says that tourism constitutes travel which is more than 24 hours less than 365 days more than 50 kilometers from your home uh, and uh, uh, having a leisure component. However tourism can essentially be seen as three different things. If you look at it from the perspective of tourists, it's an activity, it's an experience. And this experience is something that is incredibly fun. If you look at it from a social perspective, tourism is a phenomenon that is possible to happen if you have spare money, spare time and the political right to leave your home. And this looks very much uh, different because then we know that tourism is for privileged people. Only 10% of the world population are tourists. Mm. And the rest either don't have the money, the time or the political right to move. And then the third way of looking at tourism is to look at it as an industrial phenomenon. And then we look at money and we look at uh, um, businesses that are involved in tourism. What are some of the major types of tourism? Essentially the, there's cultural tourism and, and that is looking at both culture in terms of high culture but also popular culture and also the lived culture of a place. We have nature tourism which is about enjoying nature in different ways and enjoying being in nature in different ways. We have different kinds of heritage tourism, which of course is a subsector of both culture and nature because we have lived heritage and we have natural heritage. But that is then looking at the historical aspect of uh, tourism. Looking out the window today, we have a snowy day, so uh, um, weather is always a motivation. Um, Insta tourism or social media uh, induced tourism. It is, of course, very much about finding the perfect spots for social media pictures and videos. Instagram tourism is really um, a, an exciting phenomenon because it puts lots of power in the hands of people who are popular on different social media channels and also people who invent new destinations which then becomes popular mm. and this of course leads to totally new uh, challenges. Places that weren't designed for tourists become attractions. Mm. Here in Hokkaido we have the example of BA that became so popular for some trees that farmers started to put up higher and higher fences because people walked into their fields mm. and destroyed the crops mm. whilst trying to get the perfect uh, photos. You can't draw a conclusion of what is the most famous uh, or, or popular kind of tourism. Tourism has been around for ages. The, the, there's evidence of uh, Roman tourists who went to Egypt during uh, the time of Caesar and Cleopatra. There's even graffiti on the pyramids from the tourists who uh, came there 2,500 years ago. About cruise ship tourism, are there some types of tourism that's especially harmful? Well, cruise ship tourism uh, is one of these easy hitting bags because it's so evident that it is unnecessary travel because it's about going out on uh, purpose-built boats to burn diesel for a certain period of time a and you're not going anywhere you, 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 you do a loop 
quite often people don't understand how enormous the ships can be. Th that you have ships with several thousand passengers and several thousand uh, crew members who then cruise into places where there might be just a few hundred or tens mm. of, of locals. So, so uh, uh, it, it becomes very, very impactful very fast. Can I say something good about cruise tourism? If it's uh, um, uh, modern uh, ships that are well built and that are uh, running on alternative fuels, it is uh, less harmful than air travel. A and uh, if cruise ships actually would be used as transport vessels, taking people from a place to another, then they could have a place, like ferry services. Um, cruise ships can and are used as hotels uh, sometimes in uh, cities where uh, big events are happening. Uh, cruise ships are used as uh, prisons. Cruise ships are used as refugee housing. They have all the infrastructure of keeping people in a place for a longer period of time. How harmful is tourism on the natural environment in comparison to other industries? Firstly, tourism is not an industry because tourism is so many different industries patched together into one. Uh, it's transport, it's accommodation, it's uh, uh, food and beverage, it's attractions, but it's also stuff that we don't even think of. It's uh, uh, bag shops, it's uh, uh, insurance, it's uh, uh, engineering. If we think of tourism as an entity where all of these different industries are involved, the worst part of tourism is transport, and especially air transport. Um, essentially, uh, um, air transport makes up between 90 and 95 percent of all the carbon footprint of travel. If we look at the trajectory of uh, carbon uh, emissions, long-distance travel is growing exponentially. Lots of countries are building more international airports. Yeah. If the growth curve continues as it, as it is right now, then about half of the carbon emissions of the whole world will be from tourism by 2040. And, wow. and that is nuts. Perhaps you could start by giving us a definition of ecotourism, and is it actually better than regular tourism? Yes, I wanted to know through the ecotourism, the proceed could go into like maybe conservation so but compared to nobody traveling to the place and actually people traveling mm. is ecotourism benefiting more than nobody traveling to the place mm. there's a wonderful academic uh, uh, his name is brian wheeler and brian talks about ego tourism and how ecotourism quite often is people traveling for their egos mm. and he said the best kind of ecotourism mm. is if we all do mass tourism. We then go to certain locations that are already spoiled. Because that is what ecotourism, in some uh, cases, is all about. Spreading people much larger into undisturbed areas of the nature and therefore creating even more harm. Going back to a definition of ecotourism, ecotourism starts from a very uh, laudable uh, base, and that is that it should be beneficial for the locals. And with the locals is always included human and non-human. The base of ecotourism is education, that when people come to a place, they should learn about it. And like you said, Miyoko, uh, the proceeds should then benefit those locals. So ecotourism in a pure form is a good thing. When it's done in the right way, it can be brilliant because it can um, help to actually give local people a reason to protect their area. The reason why uh, Brian Wheeler calls it ecotourism is because it then becomes a marketing slogan. Like the biggest ecotourism destinations in the world, 
uh, are countries in Latin America like Costa Rica or uh, the Galapagos Islands. And the idiotic thing is, of course, that you have to fly there. So uh, if you fly across the world in order to see uh, unspoiled nature, you're an idiot because you, that is where the, the whole uh, destruction happens. Is there a case in your mind for uh, the promoting trophy hunting as long as it's managed really well? It, it's a really, really tough one. Being an animal lover myself, uh, it, it hurts just the idea. But, but trophy hunting has, just like you said, positives. Uh, in certain areas, there are animals that are impacting negatively on the lives of locals. It might be that there's too many animals or there's too little prey or the, the land size is shrinking. If this then is managed in a way so that proceeds actually flow back to communities, then it might be a benefit. As with everything, humans are greedy. That is then where the challenge is. Because who determines when there are too many animals? Who determines if a village is increasing their uh, size of uh, farming and so on, which then takes away the uh, living area for these animals so that the animals come into uh, farms and so on. Net positive for conservation, can it be? Yes, it might be. Well, uh, an example from Canada. On a lean year, there's not very much vegetation mm. and uh, uh, different animals can't feed as much as they uh, normally do. And there's less elk and uh, moose and uh, deer uh, born those years. Which means that wolves and other uh, animals also get lean years because there's not as, mu as much prey. Other years there's good uh, conditions and suddenly populations can uh, explode which then uh, ravages nature. If trophy hunting would be during just the good years, mm -hmm. then that could be a way of actually helping nature to, to regulate. But tourism seldom works together with nature. We work against nature. So uh, that, that's why I... Yeah. And conflicted, yeah. Because somebody would see certain places as experiencing over tourism, mm -hmm. and if it's able to take on some major, and if it's being effective, mm. I want to know about some cases of that. Over tourism is wh when we have more tourists than a society can absorb in their daily living, where uh, tourists are changing the dynamic of the place. Places like Barcelona uh, that became incredibly popular after the 1988 Olympics um, have whole uh, regions in town where there's no local shops anymore because all shops start to be souvenir shops. Oh, yeah. a and, and local people are more and more moving out of those blocks which then leads to more uh, t uh, tourist rentals. A and uh, Barcelona has uh, a very, very progressive uh, uh, mayor who's now st started to say enough is enough a and it is redeveloping and zoning areas so that uh, uh, people can't uh, uh, do, uh, for example, Airbnbs. This is also how we sh should think about tourism. We should think about what is it that we're trying to achieve. If we are trying to give our kids um, a job and a future to stay in our neighborhoods, then we should set a cap for it. This is what we want to have. There should be X amount of jobs, there should be X amount of tourists. There are countries in the world 
that are restricting both uh, travel by air and also countries that quite clearly are not marketing themselves anymore to far away destinations. For example, Sweden has made the de uh, decision that they no longer market themselves in Asia because the impact of uh, people flying from Asia to Sweden is such mm. so bad for the environment. So it's a little bit fun what's going on in Japan right now where the Japanese government is saying we want more uh, tourists from further away. Mm. We already have lots of good Japanese tourists. By the way, uh, one out of ten tourists is an international traveler. Nine out of ten are domestic. In Japan or just in general? In general, in the world. Okay. Most tourists are locals. A and that kind of tourism is not necessarily that bad for the environment. Uh, people can travel by train, people can uh, travel even better, they can bike around and have bike tourism. Those kinds of tourism aren't very harmful. Do humans have the right to travel? On a philosophical level, are humans just essentially free to move? We travel through regions that have nothing to do with our journey. We sit in airplanes and we fly literally over wars and uh, disaster zones to get from one place to another. And that becomes a prerogative for the few. Uh, through millennia, uh, Homo sapiens have moved. We, we are all travelers who have started from Africa and we have then uh, traversed the world and become residents of different places. So, I would say that mobility is part of humanity. How we do mobility, that is then our responsibility to think of. And we are better off for traveling. Well, uh, the cave analogy by Plato, w where people who are locked into a cave and only see the shadows on the wall, for them that is reality. And like everybody who has traveled away from their home community knows, the moment when we step out of the metaphorical cave, we see the world in totally different ways. Because suddenly we realize what culture and what presumptions we have had. Um, and we also see how we could live differently. So, so I would say yes, humans have the right to travel and it's our responsibility then to do it in a, a responsible way. Can that experience be experienced without actual physical travel, like mm. widening your perspective and learning about a different way of living? I presume we are getting closer to it through different kinds of virtual realities uh, and uh, uh, augmented realities. So, yes, I would say, uh, thanks to technology, we can learn more. Well, the, w we travel and we presume that it's our own senses that perceives lots of things. When I travel for conference, quite often my wife comes along with me. When I go to a conference, I'm there the whole day. However, thanks to having my wife along, she goes out and is a tourist during the days. And when we meet in the evening, she then tells me about the place. She tells me about the museums she went to, she tells me about the botanical gardens. And because she tells me about this and she shows me pictures, at times I imagine that I have been to those places. I've been to a conference in Milano and I saw the airport and I saw a bloody university. That, that's it. B but I have been to uh, the dome, I have been uh, in the galleries. So, so the human mind is funny. We can imagine lots of things also through virtual. And I hope that that could be something that we can build on through technology also in the future. Is there anything that we didn't ask that you think maybe the 
audience would like to know? There is a new trend uh, in tourism and it's called regenerative tourism. And it's a buzzword that um, lots of people misunderstand. Uh, but regenerative tourism is very much about communities that are regenerating th their uh, uh, place and their being. And it's about communities taking back the power of deciding what tourism is. So regenerative tourism uh, is, um, you can find examples of it in uh, small locales. Um, one that I think of is an island uh, just in Australia, between Tasmania and Australia, uh, w where they have decided on the islander's way. A and regenerative tourism holds lots of promise because it's a totally new paradigm that is not built on growth and money and economy, but rather on regenerating the nature and regenerating the culture of places so that those who live there gets the benefit if somebody comes and visits them. Those could be my parting words that tourism is a wonderful thing if we actually give local people the power and, and that is how it should be done because then people can show what they're proud of and the investments can be in things that makes their life better and they can then share it with others. Yeah. Johan, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs>